All right, so let's talk about avoiding conflict, again, for a smooth and compliant IEP meeting. I found this little cartoon. <laughs> Crap, I didn't prepare for this meeting, which is, as I said earlier, I think uh, that is a big issue. So let's look at our tips for avoiding conflict with general tip number one and with in each general tip, after I do the tip, then I have specific tips, specific suggestions for getting this right or making this better. So tip number one in my view, remember that it all starts with the invitation to the meeting. A lot of folks don't really think about that whole concept. And I feel like many times the way Congress even set up this process is a little bit intimidating, breeds distrust and anxiety from the very, very beginning. So we need to think about things from the very, very beginning. So even prior to that meeting, thinking about specific things that could make the whole thing better. So consider contacting parents for available dates ahead of time. Now, I see my clients getting a little bit better with this, but old school way was to fill out the invitation and send it off to the parent where the school has selected the date and the time and the location and just sending it and hope you can make it kind of thing. Now, how do you feel when you get an invitation, let's say, to someone's birthday party? and it has a date and a time and all that, do you feel that you can call and say, I really can't make it that day, could you move your birthday to Tuesday? Well, of course not. But I think parents feel the same way, that, oh, this is their meeting that they're inviting me to, and they've chosen the date and the time and everything. So now that we have email available, it should be pretty easy to contact parents ahead of time and say, do you have three dates within the next such and such week span that we could choose from to have an IEP meeting, rather than just sending out the notices that have predetermined dates on them. Just something to think about. Now, I'm not saying this is always going to avoid conflict, but it is something I think that is important to think about. As I said this morning, agree to reasonable and legitimate request to reschedule those meetings. I even cite Doug C. again, in case you missed this morning, but I think everybody was there, but the Doug C. case, very, very important. There are a number of cases, as I mentioned this morning, where the debate is whether or not the school system acted reasonably in rescheduling. So that's another big issue. Always make parents feel like they're going to be an equal member of the meeting and that it's important for them to be there. Now, I know, because I talked to a lot of school folks, that the biggest concern is that many times parents don't come at all. No matter how many times you call them to get dates and no matter how, how many times you try to reschedule, they just don't come. And I understand that, so I'm not talking about that. But many times it's because they don't feel comfortable. They don't really understand what goes on at the meetings. People are talking um, special ed lingo and they you know, just don't feel welcome there. So a lot of times it's because we haven't done some of the things we might could think to do beforehand. Keep detailed and um, um, records and other documentation, whether it's logs, whatever it might be, to contact uh, in terms of contacts that were made. I uh, even have clients that might make a home visit, uh, office visit, something such as that, just to sit down and talk to parents about how important it is for them to attend a meeting and our efforts certainly to uh, encourage them to come, document all of those different ways that we have used to try to reach parents with re respect to the, the meetings and uh, again their important uh, role in those meetings. I remember one time it was a discipline meeting that we needed to have but we actually hired a special courier to deliver the invitation so that we could show that and demonstrate that we had taken reasonable steps uh, to um, have the parent uh, aware of the meeting and have their input at that meeting. You'll see I've listed also a number of other cases there, lots of them, talking about documentation that the school district either had or did not have to show that it had made reasonable efforts to provide parents the opportunity to attend a meeting. And if parents indicate that they absolutely cannot attend, offer alternative ways for them to participate. The regulations actually say this right up front. 
via conference call. I think probably eventually we'll be having more virtual IEP meetings. Um, I, I, I caution with respect to those meetings though to make sure that there's good confidentiality, that we are aware of who is participating on the other line or in the other room. I think that's really important too. I had a client one time that Skyped, agreed to do a Skype IEP meeting and it was um, the Skyping was to Skype the doctor in to the discussion and evidently there was a parent attorney sitting in the back of the room who did not identify herself and then cropped in and then made everybody um, adversarial. Um, it's important that we let everybody know who is participating and for school folks to find out who might be on the other line or um, at the other end of that camera, so to speak so that we're not violating confidentiality in any way, and so that we're affording everybody the appropriate opportunity to participate. But that notice piece is very significant as far as I'm concerned. A general tip number two, preparing adequately for IEP meetings. You know, and as I say here, nothing's worse or I think less impressive than folks showing up for an IEP meeting completely unprepared. And I will tell you that I've experienced it myself, even as the school attorney. I might be invited to an IEP meeting, and as I said this morning, I do not like going to IEP meetings. I've never been to a warm, fuzzy IEP meeting. I don't know what that looks like, so that jades me a little bit. Uh, I know that there are successful good meetings, and I'd actually like to observe those, but my presence in the room will prevent that. <laughs> I mean, the reason that I go to IEP meetings is because a parent has insisted that they will have an attorney present and my client wants me there. And so I will go under those circumstances. But I generally like to introduce myself as the belligerent attorney who doesn't want to be there, who's going to sit over in the corner because I don't think I should be a participant. Um, I would rather not be there. I would rather attorneys did not. But if I'm there, I want folks to prepare, even down to where the meeting is. I show up at a school sometimes and I'll say, I'm here to, representing the school system. I'm going to such and such IEP meeting. Oh, we didn't know that was happening today. Hang on, I'll check and find out where it is. I'm sitting in the front office for 20 minutes myself, waiting to find out where it is. I think schools really need to think about just good meeting space, preparing folks with respect to certain issues, doing things like preparing agendas and that kind of thing. So specific tips here. Consider using an organized and facilitated meeting approach. And there's a lot of hype about facilitated IEP meetings and there are a number of different training programs. Uh, I've been involved in some of those, as a matter of fact, just to present some legal propositions as part of it because the legal and the process run together, as far as I'm concerned, many times. Using an organized and facilitated approach can lead to better compliance legally not even just better smooth IEP meetings with less conflict, but also to lead to compliance. And that is my interest, number one. Um, I've been uh, involved in three-day facilitated IEP trainings that some of the feedback I've gotten from those as well, it's great for an impartial person coming in, but for your local folks, they're not going to necessarily be able to put posters up and write in magic marker colors and that kind of thing. So I've actually firmly taken the position that the LEA representative should be the process leader. And I mentioned this yesterday in terms of making sure that this meeting is efficiently run. Specific, um, more specific tips in terms of the IEP meeting approach selecting appropriate meeting space, as I said, developing an agenda. An agenda is so important for any meeting. I use this one with my husband. <laughs> so if we have some important things to talk about, we list them out and we get agreement on what those kinds of things are so we don't run on all these tangents and that we keep it focused, our conversation focused. This can work with your kids no matter what. This good meeting techniques should be applied to the IEP meeting process. These are important meetings. Using ground rules, I put in quotes, in terms of rules of civility even, I've seen used um, to run an efficient meeting. Brokering communication, 
uh, training folks on using just appropriate body language, if nothing else. You know, people don't really realize that that's so important in terms of running a, a, a smooth meeting, uh, brokering communications and using good body language. Another specific tip, be sure to invite all required school participants. This is one of my, this was one of my 60 tips in 60 minutes this morning. Um, putting a little bit more attention to that, as I've listed here, the members of the IEP team, you would be surprised how much litigation happens over the mere fact that one of the required members from the school district was not present. In my view, the mandatory members, as I call them, are members two through five. I've listed in there number in, in, uh, on page, page four under uh, little tip B, that first paragraph. So I've got all of the listed members from the law itself, but in my view, two through five, from the school's perspective, are mandatory members. So we're talking about not less than one regular ed teacher of the child, and I do believe that there's a statement being made by listing regular ed teachers as the first school staff member of an IEP team. You know, this change took effect in 1997. And I always remind regular ed teachers they were added to the team membership as a result of lobbying efforts by the American Federation of Teachers, who said on behalf of regular ed teachers, we hear from them a lot that they have a lot of obligations in terms of fulfilling responsibilities and implementing the IEP. And the complaint was, well, why aren't we ever invited to these meetings? So it's kind of that old adage, you better watch what you ask for, you might get it kind of thing. And that was what happened, essentially. That regular ed teachers became a mandatory member as of July 1st, 1998, and any IEP meeting on that date or after had to include a regular ed teacher. Yes, sir. So your question is, would there ever be a case where you would not have a regular ed teacher present? Now, I'll point out the first part, the first half of your question, talking about regular ed teachers. It does say regular ed teacher of the child. And that's actually been litigated. I'm talking all the way to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals on having the right regular ed teacher. It says regular ed teacher of the child, not just someone with regular ed certification. Okay? But secondly, and that just pure technical compliance issue, but secondly, your question, would there ever be an instance where a regular ed teacher would not be present? And that question comes about because it says a regular ed teacher of the child if the child is or may be participating in regular ed. So your question was, what about a child who's in an entirely separate class and is not participating at all in the regular ed environment? The U.S. Department of Education was asked that question, and they basically said in terms of whether there would be a meeting that would not have a regular ed teacher in attendance, their comment was, it would be rare. Okay? So a lot of districts, or corporations as you call them here, and I know you do, a lot of school districts, and I use that generically, across the country take the conservative approach, and that is we're going to have a regular ed teacher there to address any issue that might come up with respect to regular ed participation. That is the overly conservative approach. There is a mechanism that I describe over bottom of page um, four and over to page five that talks about the excusal procedure. Some districts in a case involving a child who's been in self-contained, there's no thought that the child would, that, that that would change. Nobody, the parent's not thinking it, no school people are thinking that that would change. Then perhaps we would seek to excuse inviting a regular ed teacher and that's what most of my clients do. But it may be this year, the parent wants to start talking about some regular ed participation. Then I feel like we need to have someone there who could conceivably be the teacher, one of the regular ed teachers for the child. Um, but there is a, a, you know, there's a mechanism. I think that excusal procedure comes in handy for that. Although I will tell you that nationally, in terms of school districts' reaction to the excusal procedure, many of them have told me, we just don't excuse anybody. Well, that's okay, I suppose, but 
that leads to some situations where the regular ed teacher at the last minute can't be there, for instance, and we say we want to adjourn the meeting and reschedule it so that we can have everybody there, and the parent says, are you kidding me? It took me two weeks to get off work to be here. Where do I agree to excuse? So school districts are slowly but surely realizing they need an excusal procedure. Whether we use it very often or not, it's a good thing to have it. Yes? So there's no regular ed teacher present. Is that correct? So they all kind of write input in. Okay. Well, that was how the state of Florida was doing it. Actually, the State Department advised that that was okay. The U.S. DOE went into Florida and said that's not compliance. It says physical attendance, basically. Okay. Now, again, you could excuse as long as the parent's fine with that and have all the teachers write in their input. If you do excuse, you're required to have that person. If their area of service provision or area of expertise is going to be discussed at the meeting, part of excusal requires that person to put in writing their input. But when Florida... For when the whole regular ed teacher came out, the unions were real upset, which was interesting because they lobbied for it. But then they were very upset in Florida about regular ed teachers being required to attend. So there was some guidance sent out that said, okay, instead of attending, you can just all send in your input. And the USDOE said, that's not technical compliance. So just so you know. Now, this could be technically a process issue that's a no harm, no foul. But I've seen too many cases where the regular ed teacher's failure to be there was sufficient to constitute a denial of faith. So, and I'll show you those when we get there. But overall, we want to ensure that we have the required school participants there and ensure that the LEA representative is aware of his or her role or responsibility. As I mentioned this morning, LEA does not stand for least experienced administrator, right? And we want to make sure that whoever is serving in this role, and this is member number four, so back to page four. Member number four, as described in the federal regulations, this person is to meet certain criteria. This is someone who's qualified to provide or supervise a provision of specially designed instruction, somebody knowledgeable about the general curriculum, and knowledgeable about the availability of resources in the school system. And OSEP has gone so far as to say, and someone who can commit available resources. Someone who's there on behalf of the district who says, we can implement this IEP. And that's why I choose the LEA representative to be really a process manager, because sometimes I find that the LEA representative is a school administrator. And it depends from state to state, district to district, who serves in the capacity of LEA representative always seems to be different. In Florida, they have a position in every school or an itinerant position that might cover several schools called a staffing specialist. And they serve as the LEA representative and they have a lot of special education background. But I see this more as a process manager. It makes sense to me that it be a school administrator. So in Alabama, most of the time, it's assistant principal appointed. Sometimes I see a counselor being the LEA representative. Sometimes it's the, the special ed director for the district. Well, some, uh, some of my client special ed directors go to almost every meeting. Well, that doesn't make any sense. We should train folks at the local school to serve properly as the LEA representative. And a, a lot of assistant principals will come up to me, well, I don't do special ed. I don't know why I'm the LEA rep. Like, you don't need to do it. Let the content people be the experts in special ed, you're a process manager. And that we really need to focus on LEA reps. I think, again, because conflict starts at the meeting level, I think that's where we really need to nip that in the bud, really take a look at that. And train and prepare regular ed teachers regarding their role as an IEP team member. I can't tell you how many districts I've been in to actually train regular ed teachers. On the same things I train everybody on, say this, not that, you know, all of those kinds of things, stepping in deep doo-doo process, as I call it sometimes, and regular ed teachers will come up to me and thank me, saying, I really didn't realize what my role was. I didn't know that failing to be present could in and of itself constitute a denial of faith. 
on the bottom of page 5 and over to page 6, those are two very well-known cases where the simple failure to have a regular ed teacher in attendance at the meeting was deemed to be a denial of free appropriate public education in and of itself. So we owe this training to our regular ed teachers. Yes. This has been my struggle for, you know, working with clients. I will go to a meeting and I don't see a regular ed teacher present. So I'll take the LEA rep out in the hall and go, where's the regular ed teacher? <gasps> Uh-oh. And run down the hall. This was the last meeting I had. Run down the hall, can't find anybody. Run outside. There's at least one regular ed teacher standing there on bus duty. So he walks in with his walkie-talkie, sits it on the table. It's very obvious he didn't know he was supposed to be there, doesn't know why he's there. He's just filling a space. Frankly, it was probably better not to have anyone in the, at that point. So training is the way to go. I mean, I always explain to regular ed teachers, this was not something that the special ed community threw into the law. This was something the teacher unions lobbied for. And it also supports inclusion. It also, uh, all of those number of things that we need to train regular ed teachers on. But we, didn't, we tend to leave them out of the process and they don't, don't understand why they're upset. And so that's why I always advocate for training. And I'm shocked every time I do it. They'll come up to me and thank me profusely, saying, wow, Thank you so much. I finally now understand kind of what role I can take at the meeting and what role I should take in the education of children with disabilities who are in my classes. Because the entire nation is focusing on inclusive practices. That's the, the, the name of, this, of this, uh, the, this conference. So we just need to take on the responsibility. Now, is that going to be the, the full solution? No, we're still going to have teachers who say, I don't, you know, I made a choice. I don't teach special ed. I teach regular ed. And I'm not going to do this, that, and the other. There's actually a case. It's out of West Virginia. It's called Doe versus Withers. And I use this case as a case study where a regular ed teacher in West Virginia said, I'm a regular ed teacher. I'm not doing that stuff. Read my lips. I went to school to teach regular ed, not special ed, and I don't care if this child's IEP requires oral testing in his regular ed classes, I'm not doing it. And the parents sued him personally, and there were money damages awarded against him. I actually have a picture of him. <laughs> Someone came to me in a workshop because I'm from West Virginia, and Mr. Withers was one of my teachers. And I'm going to send you a picture, so she emailed me. But I certainly don't show it very often because it's probably not fair to Mr. Withers, but he was a state senator in West Virginia, and he lost his seat in more ways than one because of that. So it's kind of a, 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 a you know, Mr. Withers, poor thing. He's been talked about by more than him. But it, it, it makes an impact in training just to have that example. Yes. Yeah. Generally, the special education services are pushed in to the regular classroom so that special ed teachers can be considered highly qualified, or if they're not, as long as the regular ed teacher is, then that's going to suffice for, for HQT purposes. But to me, that is the special education teacher who is supplemental to the regular ed teacher. So. I think that argument could successfully be made by an advocate who's just, you know, bent on that point. I mean, to me, I will tell you that I think Congress should lift a couple of these kinds of things and leave a lot to the discretion of the parent and the school to work together to define who are the most important people to be at an IEP meeting. Because I can tell you in some cases it may be the special ed teacher working with the child in the regular environment would have more to offer than the regular ed teacher does. But technically to meet the spirit of the law, you could have the PE teacher who might say, I don't know anything about that child at all. But to meet the spirit of the law, their presence satisfies it. But it may be that the counselor was a better person to have at the meeting. So to me, this laundry list doesn't always necessarily, in reality, play out to having the best people for that child's planning be sitting at the IEP team table. Yes? 
Well, th this boils down to a technicality, okay? Um, some of my clients, because I'm a technocrat, know that we try, if we're going to excuse the teacher from the whole meeting or part of the meeting, because that's what the language says, if they're going to come in late or leave early, technically, we're supposed to get consent or agreement, depending on what this is, you know, it's very complicated, in writing. So my clients might have a form handy that they would use to excuse the teacher. Some of my clients, actually, for kids who have maybe four or five different regular ed teachers, they might rotate them in so that there's always a regular ed teacher there. Now, someone might argue with me that that's not technically compliant. I think it is, and I actually think it's better because you get more information from a number of sources rather than just one designated regular ed teacher. But technically, if the parent doesn't sign something, that is a procedural violation. But this might fall into the harmless error procedural violation, and a lot of times it does. A court will say, that's a technicality. The parent actually agreed. It, we just, you know, overlook the fact that the individual left before the mother signed or whatever. So I, I, I always, as best I can, want folks to understand that I'm a technocrat and I would prefer that it be done the right way, but I could also argue in the context of free appropriate public education that that didn't matter because the parent actually agreed. And the best thing to do is document the conversation. And I talked about this yesterday. Conference records, those are golden, particularly as it relates to something like that. So at least we have a record two years later when we can't remember what happened. At least we have contemporaneous notes that were taken at that meeting. So this training piece, you probably already figured out. This, this school attorney loves training. And it really has, I have found, that it really does help in terms of just an awareness issue. So in Indiana, when you occasionally have that regular ed teacher that's like, why am I here? I like to remind them, well, the AFT actually made you a mandatory member, number one, but here are the role and responsibility considerations right out of the language of the regulations. And then some case law with Mr. Withers helping ever so often. But poor Mr. Withers, he's just gotten a bad rap, but we talk about him more in regular ed teacher training than, than ever. All right, any other questions about that IEP team membership? Again, smooth, compliant IEP meetings. Let's look at general tip number three. Provide parents their rights and offer an explanation of them. And while this seems fairly easy, this was one of my tips this morning, uh, I, I, I tend to be able to find a lot to say about the parent rights. I think that they are very significant. In your materials on page six, of course, we did have what I call the green provision under IDEA that specified that basically we don't have to give them out every time we necessarily have a meeting or every time we see the parent. But I used to joke sometimes, if you're a parent or act like a parent, sound like a parent, you're going to get a bazillion copies of those procedural safeguards. And then parents would come to me and say, I am so sick of getting these, I can wallpaper my dining room with them. But we're going to give them out anyway, aren't we? And generally that happens at the beginning of every meeting, before we actually start the meeting. Um, the specific Specific tip, boy, my, my jet lag, wow, it's really getting to me today. Providing rights at the beginning of the meeting certainly came as a result of the Janes case. In the Janes case, they actually, in that school district, were mailing the rights with the invitation to the IEP meeting. But they got in litigation and the parent claimed, and she was 100% sure that she had not received those parent rights in the last two years. The person, the liaison at the school who was responsible for compliance testified that she was 100% sure that she typically did put those in the envelope before mailing out the invitation to the meeting, but she didn't have any ability to prove that she did it for this parent. So it came down to a he said, she said scenario. The hearing officer at due process believed the mother in that case and said, because you didn't get those in the past two years. The mother's claim was, because I didn't get them, I didn't know I could sue. I would have sued two years ago, because I want private school. I don't agree 
with the program that this district is providing to my child, and I didn't know I could do anything about it. So her argument was the school board should pay for two years of private school, and the hearing officer believed her and agreed with her. So school districts across the country got the message from this case, ooh, maybe we shouldn't be mailing those because we really can't track it, that kind of thing. So we'll just physically and have witnesses. I have some clients that have parents sign for them. Even sign, I, I kind of prefer actually taking the front page of the rights and having them sign that front page and we copy it and have it in the file from year to year so that we just don't have this issue. And maybe I just learn from these anecdotal stories in some of these cases. But certainly providing those at the beginning of the meeting. Now I will tell you something about the parent rights in my view as we're going through. I think it's important that parents understand what they're being provided. I actually find this to be a flaw in the law itself that actually leads to anxiety and distrust. Have any of you ever read the parent rights? I know some of you certainly probably memorized them, right? So yeah, we've read them. You should read them. All that extra time you have on your hands, take a look at those. They're actually kind of scary. They sound very legal easy to me because of the model forms that we get. We're required to send out that version, but it's very scary. Have you ever closed on a home? The whole process is sort of like that by analogy. I have several times, and lawyers just throw papers at you. Here's the HUD statement. Here's this. Here's that. And they explain it, and I'm going... I'm just saying, I'm not reading that stuff. It's sort of a similar analysis to me, where you're inundating the parent with all of this lingo, and we really need to think about that. And advocates do, hopefully, do parents a great service by helping to calm them. But I will tell you, some advocates I work with don't do that. They're wor they make it worse. So it kind of depends in terms of being litigious and wanting to have conflict versus actually understanding this process and helping parents with it. So we need to also remember that in terms of we may know what we're talking about, but we hand those rights and maybe the parent doesn't read them at the meeting. They think they had a great meeting. They walk away, get home, I don't think I'll read these. And it starts talking about you have the right to attorneys and attorney's fees and a hearing and all this stuff. It's really into Congress has set this up improperly. I mean, and two, even the membership of the team, parent walks into that first meeting, they feel over, outnumbered, overwhelmed immediately because the school has no fewer than five people there because Julie Weatherly said you have to. You see, that's another issue. I think the way it's set up breeds that anxiety and distrust that starts the conflict. So I have a lot of clients that are real careful to check for understanding and really talk a little bit about those rights rather than just handing them to them. This is what we're required to give you. Don't let it, you know, uh, concern you when you read through. If you have any problems um, with understanding, please understand you can uh, schedule an appointment with us and we'll be happy to explain those to you. Consider the development of parent-friendly versions of the rights. I have some clients that actually say, here's the legalese one and here's one that's more user-friendly. This is the one we understand better and we hope well, you will because it's parent-friendly. I have a lot of clients that have both. I also, in terms of explanation, have some clients that have put an explanation of the rights in user-friendly language on a DVD. So when a parent asks for an explanation, they all hear the same thing rather than a different person's version of an explanation of the rights which is another complication that I see that schools uh, confront sometimes. All right, let's move to general tip number four. Any questions on that one? All right, let's move to general tip number four. I've talked about this one ad nauseum. If you've been with me in my three sessions, I apologize if this is the first or even the second from this morning. This is just a follow up on how important this is because this is what's going to create conflict and this is going to sail the school district ship down the wrong river without paddles and motors and everything else if we do things that constitute predetermination. So on the opposite end, we're avoiding that and we're promoting parent participation in decision making. Now, I understand still today school people will tell me our biggest frustration, we can't get parents there. I'm not talking 
about those situations, okay? I'm really not. I'm talking about when a parent wants to be very active and wants to be a meaningful participant in all educational decision making. School folks need to train others on these specific tips. Consider seeking parent input prior to meeting. I have a lot of clients that send out a parent input form. This is to remind you we're having the meeting on such and such a date, but in order to adequately consider all of your concerns, all of your thoughts, all of your input, would you mind giving it to us ahead of time? I have a lot of clients that have that. If the parent doesn't fill it out, then who are they later on to claim they didn't get sufficient opportunity for input? And so we document these things and send it back ahead of time if you can. If not, we'll consider it at the meeting, but we want to make sure you understand that we value your input. We want to know what your concerns are. If drafts are prepared ahead of the meeting, share those with parents and make it clear that those things are draft and for discussion and preparatory purposes only. So in your materials, there are a number of court cases talking about drafts and things like that. GD versus Westmoreland is the most significant case where it was actually litigated, whether it was a violation of the law to create a draft. Is that in and of itself a predetermination of placement? And the First Circuit Court of Appeals said absolutely not. As long as it's presented as a draft. It's all in how we present that information to the parents. This is a draft for discussion purposes only. I even had a case one time where they shredded it because the parent was so concerned about this. Okay? We'll start from scratch if we need to. Like I said yesterday, I remember the days when we used to handwrite IEPs. So parents might get ahead of time a draft of handwritten goals and objectives and things like that. Making it clear that it's draft for discussion purposes only. Yes. Drafted in real time is what I call it. I actually have a client that does that and I like it because everyone's working together to draft that IEP. I've seen a lot of problems when the parents walk away from a meeting and the school folks say, we'll send you a final version and the final doesn't come out like the parent thinks it should have. And they, again, that sort of anxiety, distrust, I have to look at every word, is that what was really said? Rather than developing that final altogether, I like that approach. I don't think Congress ever envisioned a 12-hour IP meeting. I really don't. In fact, in the old legislative history, when you look at what Congress was saying as they were putting in place in 1974 the draft of Public Law 94-142, there was commentary in there that said that a typical IEP meeting should take about 30 minutes. Not even on a good day, right? So something got lost along the way. Um, but I generally am a believer and we do what it takes to get to the point where there's agreement, what it takes, and I know that sometimes that causes some issue. And I've been involved in disputes with teacher union groups in terms of keeping people in those kinds of meetings. But hopefully we can establish our timelines at the very beginning. That's part of that organized meeting approach. Let's talk about that. Does anybody have to leave at a certain time? So we know how long we're going to work today. And let's be as efficient as we possibly can. But sometimes those 12-hour, um, you know, what I might call marathon IEP meetings are, are necessary. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, no, yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. There's so many things we can do ahead of time to avoid the conflict piece and basically to improve what we ultimately come up with. Adequately prepare, but don't predetermine. Certainly, it is important to engage in what the law refers to as preparatory activities. So at the bottom of page 8, you'll see IDA actually talks about engaging in preparatory activities, and that's not a form of predetermination. But if someone goes to some sort of meeting ahead of time, and they're convinced that something was decided, they might blurt out during the meeting, but in our staff meeting yesterday, I thought we already decided she's not going to participate in regular ed, or something such as that. 
So we have to make it very clear to everyone involved in preparatory activities that they are preparatory in nature only, that we make our final decisions with respect to needs and services at our IEP meeting with the parent present, hopefully, if they choose to attend. A lot of times, too, I also will indicate, at least in my experience, that 99.9% .9 of parents appreciate the preparation, and they're not going to allege that preparatory activities amount to predetermination unless they truly believe it or if they have a belligerent lawyer that makes that argument. But when we get in litigation, it's a very common argument. Uh, if, if communication's broken down, the relationship is broken, we get in litigation, there is always some allegation that something was predetermined. Generally, it doesn't turn out that way, but um, we, we do hear that argument. So we want to train folks about things that do constitute predetermination. But preparation is just as important in terms of avoiding conflict and running smooth meetings it's as important as not predetermining placement. So sometimes there can be a fine line there. I love the Doyle case that's listed on page 8, the Doyle case. School officials, it acknowledges preparatory activities must occur. School officials must come to the IEP table with an open mind, but this does not mean they come with a blank mind, which I really like that lingo. Now, okay, admit it, how many of you have gone to an IEP meeting with a blank mind? Sometimes, unfortunately, that happens, but um, in most cases, we need to train on what looks, what is a predetermination. The Spielberg case, I mentioned this to the group yesterday, I always cite Spielberg, because it was the lawyer for the school system that, pre that, that actually predetermined or presented the evidence on predetermination by writing a letter to the lawyer for the family that said, this is to remind you we'll be having an IEP meeting, but before we get there, you should know the school team's already met and they've decided this child's program will be X and will not discuss anything else. That was exhibit one for the parent's attorney. That's not something you want to have happen as a school attorney. So it's sort of a school attorney's nightmare case, but the letter the court took the letter, reprinted it in the decision, and said this is clearly predetermination and in and of itself constitutes a denial of free appropriate public education. So that's one of those, as I said this morning, that is the procedural sin that is predetermination. Train staff regarding the use of these computerized and web-based IEP programs. I brought this one up yesterday. This one bothers me in terms of sometimes Pushing a button is easier than thinking about the individual needs of the child. So we have to, as I call it, think outside the drop box in terms of making sure that we're not constrained in any way by the nature of the computer program, the software program or a web-based IEP program, whatever it might be uh, that your, your actual district uses. So we need to train staff on that. It's very, very important. Be sure to explain any coded or other items that we find in IEPs. Again, it's all part of parent participation. If they don't understand what's in that IEP, that might lead to conflict. You hand it to them, they're like, mm, afraid to ask a question because they might sound silly if they do. We need to take the affirmative step of asking. Do you understand everything in here? Is there anything we need to interpret? Again, I really like that it's up on the screen. Everybody's looking at it. That's very helpful, too. Other, all team members can then be responsible for some of these process issues. Document thorough consideration of parent requests, even the ones that may actually sound pretty silly. And I think keeping drafts of IEPs, meeting notes, all of those kinds of things are important, too. So sometimes drafts of IEPs have actually helped a school district show that it did not predetermine that here's the draft before we went into the meeting, here's what finally came about, and here's where we had a lot of parent input. And we added pursuant to parent input. But d considering keeping drafts is one way of doing that, and then documenting through conference records, and we've already talked about that. I think that's really important. I mentioned the case this morning of the... Uh, the RL case out of Miami where the LEA just sort of cut the parent off and said, we're not going there. If you don't like it, you can request mediation. That's important. That's kind of what I'm talking about here. Thorough consideration of parent requests, 
parent input, very, very important. Do not overstate the purpose of an IEP meeting. Don't want to start out your meeting by saying something like, we're here today to develop an IEP for Johnny to go to the self-contained class or something like that. Because in the introduction, that could be considered a predetermination of placement. So we need to be very, very careful about that. That's the Barry case in your materials, actually, that I cite. That's a very well-known case. Sharing all evaluative information. I mentioned this one this morning. It's all part of parent participation. How can I be a equal participant if I don't have available to me the same information that the school folks have that form the basis of the recommendations here. So those are the arguments in those kinds of cases as well. All right, what time are we finished? 11.45. Okay. So we'll make sure I'm on track. General tip number five, allow for participation of parent invitees at meetings. This is category six in that membership back on page four. This is that discretionary category, at the discretion of the school district or the parent. People with knowledge or special expertise may be invited to an IEP meeting. And I call this the parent invitee. And as the U.S. Department of Education indicated, parents decide if their invitees have that knowledge or special expertise. So sometimes we have additional members that come in that are supporting the parent in some form or fashion. Specific tips here, ask the parents ahead of time who they might bring. I had a client who actually modified the invitation to the IEP meeting, and it does advise, we're required to advise parents that they have the right to bring with them to an, any meeting people with knowledge or special expertise. This district went a little bit further and said, and if you are bringing someone, please let us know who that will be. And then at the bottom of the sheet, it was a tear-off where the parent could fill out, yes, I'm coming, or no, I can't, and please reschedule, and I will bring blank. And one particular parent in that district wrote, I will bring cookies. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's so great. And of course, the special ed director said, I'm going to have to redo this form again to make it clear that I mean people, not food products. I was like, you know, you need to have a sense of humor about this. The more cookies we have at IEP meetings, the better. The more smoothly they will go. So you bring the casserole, I'll bring the beer, we'll just have a great time at that IEP <laughs> meeting. You know, what, whatever it takes to get through and have a smooth IEP meeting. I love the cookie story. I actually do. I thought it was great. So you got to have a sense of humor about all this, right? Ascertain the identity and role of invitees. I think that's important in terms of, I've had, I've had situations where the school team might sit there and after the meeting there, who was that woman sitting over in the corner? Ask. We need to find out who those folks are so we can ensure to give them the opportunity to adequately participate so we know what role they have in the child's life. So we want to be very, very careful to ascertain who these folks are, but certainly we need to smile and welcome all invitees, because there really isn't a cutoff in terms of who parents can bring if they believe that individual has knowledge or special expertise. And consider only in situations where the parent brings an attorney, consider whether you need to have the school attorney there. I clearly do believe it's the right of the school district to be represented if the parent has an attorney and to adjourn the meeting if a parent brings an attorney and the school was not informed ahead of time. I actually object personally, professionally, and sometimes ethically, when a parent attorney knows that I represent the district and they have not bothered to contact me ahead of time. I think they have an obligation. The attorney has the obligation to do that. Not the parent, but the attorney really has an ethical obligation, I think. But if they show up unannounced, represented, then I do think school districts clearly have the right to adjourn. I had a situation one time where uh, unfortunately or fortunately, I mean, my clients appreciate it, but sometimes it backfires on me. I always have my schedule on my website in terms of, I mean, it, everyone who wants to know where Julie is, they know I'm in Indianapolis today because I have that on my website so that they will understand where I am and I'll get back with them when I finish speaking or whatever it might be. But sometimes parent attorneys find that out too. So they try to schedule the meeting or they show up at a meeting when they know I represent the client. And one particular attorney in Florida did this to my client. And my client, they show up at the meeting and she walks in and she's got this pin that's actually a recording device. 
And she's sticking it in the face of my client saying, you must go forward. You can't, you know, and she said, we're not going forward. Because I had already told her if something like that ever happened, that she could take the position that the school district has the right to be represented. And this lawyer was yelling in her face, telling her that they were violating the law by adjourning the meeting. Clearly not the case, in my view. But I always am adamant that, hey, if something happens, even if an advocate shows up that is difficult to deal with, and generally we know who they are, I think the team has the right to adjourn if we didn't know ahead of time. If they feel uncomfortable going forward, if it starts to get litigious. Let's look at general tip number six over on page 12 of your materials, considering recommendations of private evaluators. Again, another thing that leads to compliance, number one, but smooth meetings, too. We're open. We have an open mind to everything that you bring to the table, parents, and we're going to consider everything, including private evaluators' recommendations. And I talked about this one this morning as well in terms of one of those really important tips. Specific tips prior to meeting, ask parents for any update of evaluative information as part of the parent input forms and surveys. Do you have any additional evaluative information that we might need to consider at this meeting? When the parents actually mention to someone at the school, we need to train everybody to keep an ear out for this, that there is a private evaluation going on. Make sure that we follow up and ask for copies or ask for information from the parent. You know, you mentioned that evaluation that you were getting done. Did, did that happen? Is that something we need to consider, uh, sit down and have a meeting about? That kind of thing. If parent provides the evaluation report, convene the team to consider the results. I mentioned this morning, sometimes I've had cases where the counselor, it's faxed to the front office, the counselor gets it and just puts it in the file. Out of sight, out of mind. I actually had a case where it was faxed to the special ed director who let it go for like eight months. And we were taking the position that we had no knowledge of a certain condition that had been diagnosed, and he looked back in his files and found that report that had been sitting there. So not to throw him under the bus, I just suggested we settle that case uh, in terms of child fine and, and failure to revisit some updated information. But clearly, we should consider results but the operative word there, as I mentioned this morning, is consider, not be bound by, right? And I told you the story about the psychologist ripping the report in half uh, during the meeting. General tip number seven, remember the I and IEP and the I and IDEA. It's all about individual needs. This was one of my tips this morning. This was the subject of my whole afternoon discussion with some of you yesterday. So I'm not going to belabor this point, but it's huge. It's actually a form of predetermination in some ways, in terms of not looking at the individual needs of the child, always making sure to respond to requests of parents based on the needs of the student. And I actually have there, instead of saying, I'm sorry, we just don't have that here, the way to train people to respond to parental requests is based on the needs of the child. Let's frame our response always based on the needs. It's our belief that what the student needs to benefit from special education or receive a meaningful educational benefit. There are a few different ways to say it. We believe that's what we're proposing. Not, we don't have that here, my schedule won't allow that. All of those things that are really not relevant and can get us into legal hot water and lead to conflict with the parent. Avoid those one-size-fits-all statements. Well, this is the way we always do it for autistic children. Those kinds of things are very, very scary. And not only lead to conflict, but lead to noncompliance as well. Avoid mentioning cost. Just not helpful. Bottom line is, clearly, it doesn't matter how expensive. We all know special ed services are very, very expensive. It's just not helpful. This is one of those things that's actually come up several IEP meetings I've been to. I wear pointed boots to IEP meetings and I sit in proximity of the ones that I think are going to be the bad children at an IEP meeting. Usually it's a school administrator who's going to bring cost up in the discussion. And I remember kicking an assistant principal one time under the table and she went, ow, so if your school attorney happens to kick you under the table, don't respond, just take the hint in terms of these kinds of issues. But cost isn't helpful. As I mentioned to the group yesterday, the Cedar Rapids case 
actually confirm this for me. That while in reality, cost of services is a practical concern, particularly in light of the fact that Congress has chosen, frankly, not to fulfill the promise they made in the early 70s when they started talking about this law, that they would fund up to 40% of the cost of special ed services to school, excess cost of special ed services to school districts and states. And I think, based on my calculations, they've never made it beyond about 18%. And now they say they were kidding all along about uh, that 40%. And we've actually lost a huge advocate in the Senate. Senator Tom Harkin from Iowa was what I refer to as, as Senator IDEA, who was always on the forefront advocating for the full funding of the IDEA. And he retired this past year. So we've kind of lost that advocate for schools and students, as far as I'm concerned, as it relates to the funding issue. So we struggle, and we continue to struggle with that. But in the Cedar Rapids case, the Supreme Court said, we're not really concerned with cost. If it's necessary for the child to benefit from special education, and in this case, a one-to-one -one full-time licensed practical nurse was found necessary for educational purposes, the court said, so sorry, but cost is not the factor to consider. With that, are there any other suggestions? Anything that you think I should add to this list? I know there are a lot of things, but I knew I only had an hour and 15 minutes. Or any other questions, comments, or concerns? Yes. Well, the question is, basically, when I was talking about training regular ed teachers, certainly I do never mean to leave anybody out of the training, okay? <laughs> because when I go into school districts, I generally train all the staff. Okay, but I have had special requests for just sessions for regular ed teachers. Usually in a district, there are not enough school psychologists for me to have a whole day session, but they may be included in the entire body of people who are mandated to be there, like uh, the training I did in Fairbanks, Alabama. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm already back in Alabama. Right? Fairbanks, Alaska, just this, this week, Monday and Tuesday, there were a lot of school psychologists in the 504 training. But many times I do find school psychologists are in my general trainings on special education laws. I train at the National Association of School Psychologists. Two weeks ago I was in Orlando for their convention. And I did a session from 7 in the morning to 10. And it was packed. I thought, oh, no one's going to come at 7 a.m. It was packed. So they do need to learn sometimes, if they haven't already, some of the PR skills that are very important. I think all of these kinds of things relate to PR, but they also relate to legal compliance. So you get sort of two birds with one stone in some respects, because I see a lot of these things that not only lead to good, efficient, conflict-free meetings, but also keep people in compliance. But School psychologists, I, I really firmly believe, don't realize, because they're experts in their field, how they may be speaking over everyone's heads. And a lot of times, I think even school personnel defer to the school psychologist on things, because they seem like they might know a little bit more, and they use vocabulary that's a little bit more precise, perhaps, as it relates to evaluation results but they're not necessarily out there serving as the one that makes the decision. They shouldn't be. They shouldn't want to be out on that limb by themselves. Have any of you ever seen that video? I'm sure some of you have. Um, and sometimes I think maybe I should show it before one something like this. And some of the, my client special ed directors have, have shown it at trainings, and they've gotten mixed reviews on it. But it's a little cartoon. It's kind of like little bears. And there, it's a conversation between the special ed director and a parent. And it's, it's, in my view, it's very well done if you can have a sense of humor about it. But some, some school people don't think it's very funny. But I, it, it talks about Dr. Johnson, the school psychologist. And Dr. Johnson knows what your child needs. And the director can't get the child's name right. So it's a little bit overdone. But he says, well, Dr. Johnson knows he has a beard. And I find that very fun, I mean, because my husband has a beard, so, and our photographer has a beard. It's like, hey, yeah, you got a beard, you must know. 
And so it's just sort of reflective of how intimidating that whole process can be to a parent and some of the things you need to think about. I don't show it because a lot of educators don't really like it very much. And it is overdone. It's over the top. I mean, in terms of all of the things that can go badly in one conversation, they're all right there. But I've had some special ed directors who said, I'm showing that. Um, there are a couple of those. I think it's a a, a law firm or somebody who put that together and, and so you can find it on YouTube and if you have a sense of humor it's actually kind of funny my law partner and I like it but uh, you know I, I, I love educators that's where I come from and so I have a sense of humor about it but sometimes not but I love the reference to Dr. Johnson the school psychologist and he knows because he has a beard um, which is really funny but that can be very intimidating uh, school psychologists yes they know their stuff but they're a team member just like anybody else. Anything else? Now, if we're preparing for a meeting where we don't expect that there are going to be any concerns, and that's why it helps to touch base with the parent ahead of time and figure out what it is that is concerning them so we can allot enough time. That's a very good point. So that, that goes into adequate preparation as well as meeting space. You know, boy, I can't tell you how many meetings I've had in the library on those little bitty chairs. My back is killing me by the time, you know, so we, you know, schools need to actually have rooms that are, are confidential, you know, that consider confidentiality that are reserved for these very important meetings. Because as far as I'm concerned, if you're really interested in avoiding conflict in special ed, the meeting is where it starts. Now, LEA representatives are the ones that need to be the leaders and trained on all of these kinds of things in addition to everybody else, but they, they clearly need to be trained.